Five days into the season, and we already have a no-hitter. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, April 2nd. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, Astro starter Ronel Blanco threw a no-no. Shota Imanaga looked great in his debut, and third base is a mess. Looks like we're going to have to find some Josh Young replacements after having to replace Royce Lewis uh, uh, right after opening day as well. Let's jump in. Go hitter! The 30-year-old makes magic on April Fool's Day. Great call, courtesy of the Astros TV broadcast right after the final out there uh, for Ronel Blanco. And who wants the breadstick? I think it's Scott, right? I'll take a bite of this breadstick, Ronel Blanco of the Astros. Who I had, you know, I I, I was kind of open minded to him coming out of spring training. Uh, you may remember. I don't know if you guys saw what Ronel Blanco did in spring training. In fifteen and two thirds innings, he struck out eighteen. He allowed six hits in fifteen and two thirds innings, and apparently preventing hits something hmm. he's pretty good at because here he is preventing them over nine innings. So um, I I think. The way I put it is he kind of has some like Christian Javier type qualities to him in that Ronel Blanco is a fly ball pitcher who has struggled with command at times, but has good bat missing characteristics. And during his time in the majors last year, 15.7% swinging strike rate, which is very good. He had 20 swinging strikes on his 105 pitches in this no hitter. So this isn't like the Reed Detmers no hitter a couple years ago where he got like didn't he get sent down right afterward or very I mean, soon afterward? Two or three starts after the no-hitter, he, he got sent down. Yeah, he wasn't getting any strikeouts at all. Like, it wasn't just that Ronel Blanco happened to prevent hits in this game. It's that he is he has an arsenal that he that should excel at hit prevention, both because of the fly balls and the missed bats. And I don't see why he wouldn't deserve a major league roster spot with that profile. He is 30. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I said, the, 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 the control history there, the, the history of throwing strikes isn't, isn't great. It's not Joe Boyle level. It's like, you know, four and a half walks per nine over his minor league career. But I think maybe, uh, there might be some hesitance to buy into Ronel Blanco one, because he's 30 and two, because Justin Verlander is expected back in the Astros rotation soon. Well, J.P. France is also in the Astros rotation, and I checked. He does have minor league options. He's no great shakes, all right? I, I think Ronel Blanco, there's a lot more here to like, and I think, obviously, he made a big statement in this start, and I think he could continue to be interesting for fantasy. Uh, would I call him must-add? You know, it depends how shallow the league is, I guess. I, I don't know that in, in 10 team leagues you're going to be able to drop your worst pitcher for him, but I would like to add Ronel Blanco if I can find a way to make it happen. I, I think that the strikeout upside makes it uh makes it worth doing. He's not, I, I think, a like he's probably not the highest priority pitching ad, even from right. today. I think there is at least one starting pitcher I would add ahead of him. Do we want to get into that? Sure. Tanner Houck, uh, I think, was really, really impressive today in, in ways that I think suggest a little more upside than Ronald Blanco. Obviously, I, I think part of that is maybe me being a little bit of an ageist, although I am six years older than Ronald Blanco, so I think that's an unfair accusation by whoever made it. But You made I, it. But I think how <laughs> the the swing and miss stuff, I think, is probably a little more projectable for how I think the overall stuff profile is a little more impressive. Um, but Blanco was very, very impressive. And it wasn't like like Scott said, it wasn't a Reed Detmer situation or even remember Michael Lorenzen had a no hitter last season right after he got traded to the Phillies sure uh, and then completely fell apart. I think it was more impressive than either one of those. The changeup looks really, really good and was a really good swing and miss pitch last season when Blanco was in the majors as well. Um, I think the slider is the other pitch that he used a bunch and got a bunch of swings and misses, and that also was a pretty good swing and miss pitch last year. 
I think Blanco's fastball is probably going to be pretty bad. Um, and that's a, a limiting factor. But well, well, here's here's something that has to so so the fastball was the third most used pitch by mm-hmm. him today. He threw both the changeup and the slider more, which is how which is how you can survive without a very good fastball. And he his previous two years in the majors, you know, he got a decent amount of time in the majors last year, mm-hmm. hardly any in 2022. But we didn't see the changeup much at all mm-hmm. those years. So this is kind of a new pitch for Ronel Blanco. And maybe it's what's helped bring it all together for him. So I I would say that's another reason to be encouraged, even though he's 30 and you might be. It, it, normally, it would be right to dismiss a player who's who's getting his first big opportunity in the majors at age 30. And and along those same lines, I think it's also just, it's a bet on an organization that in the Houston Astros that gets a lot of these things right. And so I, I think that's another reason to be optimistic about Ronald out Blanco. That being said, Tanner Houck was also really, really impressive. 10 strikeouts in six innings, 16 swings and misses on 83 pitches. Nine on the slider that we we know the slider for Tanner Houck is a phenomenal pitch. But I think the most interesting thing here was that splitter that he's been working on for a little while, but he threw it 20% of the time today. I think it was like a 10% pitch for him last year. He got three swings and misses on that one, threw it in the zone a whole bunch and got good results on it. So I, I think Tanner Houck was a little more interesting, but that's not to say that Renal Blanco is not interesting. It's just that I would rather have Hauk. I'd rather have Jared Jones. I, I think he's behind Garrett Crochet if he's still available, but a lot of those guys may not be available in your leagues. Certainly, I just looked mm-hmm. in one of my leagues, and, and Blanco is the only one of Jones, Crochet, and Hauk who is available. I, I'd rather have Blanco wow. than Sean Manaya. How deep was that league? Uh, it's a 12 team roto league. So not I mean, so like 350, 360 players. Yeah, something roster. like that. I think seven bench yeah. spots. Um, plus unlimited IL. So probably mm-hmm. 350 plus rostered. I think I'd rather have Blanco than Reese Olsen, who I, I do think is pretty interesting. I'd I'd rather have him than Luis Heel, who again, yeah. interesting, but didn't have a great start. Would rather have him than Max Meyer. All of these guys are rostered in more leagues than him and um yeah so i, I don't i don't think that's overreacting i don't think it's underreacting no. no i think i'm i think i agree with every one of those comparisons you did the closest one for me is tanner hauk mm-hmm. and i i the fact he had 10 strikeouts and no walks i understand it was at oakland yeah and so maybe that diminishes it relative to Ronel Blanco throwing a no-hitter against the Blue Jays. The Bo bichette Blue Jays, I will add. But I don't think it's a situation in, in, in like a shallower league where you can be like, okay, Tanner Houck's going to sneak by people. Yeah. Uh, because Ronel Blanco got the bigger headline today. I, I don't think either of, them's go- e- either of them is going to sneak by anybody. And so... I, I guess I'd lean slightly toward Hauk. Also, I mean, there is a chance Blanco does get sent down when, mm-hmm. when Verlander's healthy, despite this no hitter. I, I'm not, I, I don't think that has to happen, but there, there is a chance it could happen. And, and how has more job security for that reason. Uh, Reese Olsen, yeah, I, I might like him a little more than Blanco too, though. In the that shallow league scenario I talked about, yeah. I think there is a chance Olsen, you could just leave him out there and probably have another shot at him later. Less likely with Blanco. Um, so I guess it's like, would you would you drop Luis Severino for Blanco? Would you drop AJ Puck for Blanco? I don't think I could drop Puck for Blanco. Blanco. I'm I am I am all in on Puck having a bounce back start and a breakout season. And I'm not ready to abandon that over what seemed to me like a black sheep event, but I don't know. Now, now's your only shot at Blanco. So maybe, yeah, that's, that's the thing is between now and AJ Puck's next start. Hopefully you won't have anybody else worth dropping, but something could happen and and a roster spot could open up and, Maybe AJ Puck is terrific in his next start, and we're all ra- racing out to add him if he's dropped. But you might be able to sneak that one through. Um, 
So I don't know. That that's a tough one. Yeah. Certainly if it's like if you have Kyle Hendricks, you can let sure. him go. Yeah. Ryan Weathers. Yes. Trevor Rogers, Tyler McGill, JP Sears, Kenta Maeda. I th- I'd be fine with it. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd be I fine with I, it too. I, I don't think anybody's beating down the door to to add Kenta Maeda. Although he is facing Oakland later this week. Well, no, that's the that's that's the thing is I, I think any of those guys you just mentioned could bounce back in their next starts and and be someone that we're looking to add, but it's just you have to make a decision right now. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I guess a lot of leagues you don't. You can't make ad drops until next Sunday, in which case this is all kind of a moot point. But for that's, those of you in open I mean, it's a open, minority of leagues yeah. that are like that. Most it, for the, those of you in open or daily fab leagues, you could you should, uh, I think, drop any of those guys we mentioned. Weathers, yeah, Maeda, uh, I don't. They're yeah, just no. Rewind it, twenty seconds and hear the list. And like, I, it it may sound to some people like we're overreacting here with Ronel Blanco, who is he got one mention during spring training on this podcast, right? Yeah, as I far think as so. I know. Yeah. Um, but it's. It's it's less it's less a hard hitting baseball analysis take. Like here is my scouting report on Ronel Blanco and why he's for sure going to be awesome. Than a these 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 are the realities of playing fantasy baseball. Mm-hmm. Take like somebody in your league is going to pick him up, and there's a chance he could be a breakout pitcher this year. There's but- there's enough reason for optimism that you, if you're trying to corral as many breakouts as you can. It's worth making a move for Rona Blanco if you if you have somebody you can justify dropping. By the way, I a move I would not make, but Frank, you may disagree. I would not drop Logan Webb for Rona Blanco. <laughs> no, I, I think I probably would actually. If you watched Logan Webb's spring training, it was it was a pretty rough one. Uh, people might be wondering what the heck is going on. So Chris <laughs> went out and tweeted. I thought this was just like a behind closed doors type. Absolutely thing. not. <laughs> uh, Chris tweeted a little snafu, a little, you know, I warned everybody on yesterday's podcast, beware of April Fool's Day. And then turns out the joke was on me all along because Sunday, Easter, creating a rundown for three days worth of baseball, putting in fab waiver claims. I accidentally dropped Logan Webb in one of my leagues. So uh, don't do that. Uh, thank you, Scott, for reversing the move. Obviously, I didn't mean to do that, but uh, I woke up in a panic of emails from people making fun of me for dropping <laughs> Logan Webb, which I obviously didn't mean to do. So, uh, well, what's yes. funny is you didn't like text me about it. Like, I just happened to see the other emails. I was like, "Did you not think I would reverse that for you?" No, I I texted you as soon as I saw it, and no, I said, I "Never got your text." So, I definitely did not mean to drop Logan Webb in Memorial Magley. <laughs> I meant to drop Will Smith. <laughs> And then I, thought, I was confused because you said, who did you actually mean to drop? And I was like, I just, yeah, I never saw your text. That is so yeah. Anywho, got our wires crossed there, Logan Webb, obviously Blanco, no hitter. We're excited about him. He's 18% rostered. He's widely available. He is a spark. If you play in points leagues, also excited about Tanner Houck. I think it's a clean sweep. I like both. I do slightly prefer Tanner Houck over Ronel Blanco. Let's quickly hit on Shota Imanaga, who looked pretty awesome in his debut going up against the Rockies. In Chicago, where it was like 45 degrees, super cold there. Six shutout innings, two hits, zero walks, nine strikeouts, 20 swinging strikes on 92 pitches for Imanaga. 12 of those 20 swinging strikes on the splitter, five on the fastball, three on the sweeper. Uh, He averaged 92.5 miles per hour on that fastball. He maxed out at 94, was throwing it up in the zone. I watched a lot of this start. He looked really good. The one thing that I noticed, and this Fits the profile. Mm-hmm. Gave up some hard contact. Eight hard hits allowed. 94.5 average exit velocity against. Imanaga had three fly balls travel 350 plus feet. And if it was a summer day in Wrigley yeah. or the wind was blowing out, some of those might have left the yard. So I, I just want to be transparent and realistic with Shota Imanaga. I think he's going to be really good. I think there's going to be lots of strikeouts. But as we've said, there might be some issues with home runs and um, I think today I, was a little bit foreshadowing for that. So I think there was a single ground ball uh, off of Shota Imanaga in this game. If I'm looking at the, uh, if I'm reading the chart correctly, I'm I'm just looking at the the exit velocity. But 
only one batted ball with a launch angle below 10 degrees yeah. in this start. And he had what eight batted balls over 95 miles per hour. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think in different circumstances, perhaps against a lineup with more than one player who could actually punish you. And that guy's lefty. Uh, yeah. It might've gone differently, but he looked awesome either way, you know, like, 14 uh sorry five swings and misses on the on the four seamer 12 with the splitter that looks like an absolutely devastating pitch three on only 10 sweepers is very good um i think my expectations for shodi managa are very similar to what they were coming into the season era it could be it could be pretty ugly I could see Shota Imanaga having a good season and still having like a high three ZRA. Yeah. I think everything else is going to be really good though. I think he's going to get a ton of strikeouts. I think he's going to win some games. I think the whip's probably going to be pretty good. I think it's so. just a question of like, can he be a one, one, five whip guy and a three, nine ERA guy? I think that's actually within the realm of possibility, which is a hard thing to pull off, but would still make Imanaga a very, very good pitcher. And look, it's possible yeah. that it's more like a mid three ZRA, in which case he might would, be a top 25 starting pitcher. I would bet against it. I, oh, I, I would think, absolutely bet against it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm imagining and put, put out of your mind that I've called Jay, I've called Joe Ryan a big bust this year. Just Joe Ryan, what he's bidden so far in his career. That's what I imagine Shota Imanaga's mm -hmm. stat line looking like. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think somewhere in the mid to high threes, you know, a, a good whip and a really, really good strikeout rate. That That's what I would be expecting here from Imanaga. But a very successful debut. Uh, shout out to those who actually started him. Not like me, where I mentioned I, I did bench him in one of my leagues, unfortunately. Let's quickly promote a few things. Make sure to subscribe to the FBT newsletter. If you haven't already, scan the QR code if you're watching us on YouTube or head to cbssports.com slash newsletters. Click on that FBT logo. Punch in your email address. It's easy as that. Get sent to your uh, email every single day. And a reminder that you can download and follow FBT and FBT and 5 on Spotify. Let's take our first break. When we return, we'll talk about this injury to Josh Young, and we'll do that right after this. One last shot to seal their fate. Who will earn the chance to be champions? It's the Copa Italia semifinals on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back in. Third base has been dealt a few blows already. First, we got Royce Lewis, who is going to miss at least a month with a quad strain. And now Josh Young. Ugh. If the guy didn't have, what's the saying? If he didn't have bad luck, he wouldn't have any luck at all. Jeez, yeah. man. Uh, he's been diagnosed with a fractured right wrist after getting hit by a pitch. Obviously not his fault. He's dealt with a few kind of freak injury type things already in his career. So it sucks. We haven't been given a timeline. I guess, Chris, did you look into what the timeline is? I'm going to look it okay. up right now if you want to stall for time. I will continue talking then. In the meantime, I think Ezekiel Duran makes sense as the replacement there. Perhaps the Rangers promote their prospect, Justin Foscu, but I would still bet on Duran just being the guy for now. He's 13% rostered, has third base shortstop and outfield eligibility on CBS. There's a little bit of power. There's some speed. Obviously, it's a great lineup. Scott, any interest in adding uh, Ezekiel Duran, 13% rostered as a replacement? I mean, I'm more interested in the Twins replacement at third base, Willie Castro, if he's still out there, especially in Roto. Uh, but I don't think Duran is going to be a good points league player either because mm -hmm. the walk rate's so low. Maybe the lineup context makes him a little better. Probably in points leagues, you're it's shallower anyway, so you probably have better choices. And Roto, yeah, I, I think Ezekiel Duran's of some interest. If he really is the one getting the the everyday at bats. Willie Castro, by the way, 27% rostered on CBS. He has third base and outfield eligibility. Stole 33 bags with the Twins last year. So definitely mm -hmm. could be a source of stolen Maybe bases. Maybe could be for you what Esteari Ruiz was going to be for Ooh. somebody. At least for the next two months while Royce Lewis is out. Maybe you could, maybe you know you got if you lost Josh Young in, in those Roto leagues, you got competition with the person who lost Estere Ruiz. I will say <laughs> that. Not that he was injured, but he got sent down. Yes. 
And uh, I mean, look, we can mention it now while we're talking about it. Esteri Ruiz, at first I thought this was an April Fool's Day joke. It was not because it came out from multiple A's beat writers that Ruiz was sent to AAA to make room for Tyler Nevin, whom they claimed off waivers. Ruiz is still 76% rostered. Uh, are you guys holding on to him in five outfielder roto leagues for now? I mean, that's the only kind of league you hold on to him in, but I think you are because he's yeah. a one of one sort of player and didn't really it's, deserve this demotion. I mean, he was off to a good start for the the amount he had played. It's going to be a short one, I think. That that was th- there's a direct quote, pretty much from the A's GM uh, David Forst, who told reporters that Ruiz was having better plate appearances during the spring is the justification for sending him down. They're going to play him at the leadoff spot every day at AAA. Quote, and I'm hoping it's not a long stay for him down there. Well, that's your decision. As I always find it funny when GMs and managers are like, I hope he comes back soon. It's like, (laughs) well, hold up. Like, who who gets to make that call? My guy, it's you. You're the one who decided to send him down. You're the one who can call him up whenever you want to, but that's beside the point. I think this is a very dumb decision, even if Ruiz has obvious flaws and and limitations as a player. Um, By the way, there are a lot of different ways that a fractured wrist can go. Max Muncy came back in about 15 days when he fractured his wrist back in August of 2019. Um... Eli White missed the final 115 games of the 2022 season. (laughs) Jake Cronenworth missed the final 37 games of last season. Gary Sanchez missed the final 25 last year. Orlando Arcia only missed 23 last April. So it can really go a lot of different ways. Trevor Story in 2022 missed 45 days. So I haven't heard them use the word like hairline, you know? Yeah. So with fracture. I, I, I th- think the best case scenario is probably something like three weeks, but it, it could very well be a month, multiple months. As a general rule, I would say it takes six weeks for a broken bone to heal. It's the, the absence, you know, it would depend if there's surgery needed. It would depend how big the bone is that's broken. But like if it's a, like I, I think six to six to eight weeks, if you're mm-hmm. we'll wait for the official diagnosis, Gnosis, but if you just want a ballpark estimate right now, I'm thinking six to eight weeks for Josh Young. It's so annoying, man. Like he broke his thumb on a weird, like it was like a, I think it was just a line drive that he caught and it broke his thumb last year. He injured his shoulder weightlifting in 2022 when he was about to make his MLB debut was probably going to break camp with the team. It's just been awful, awful luck. And like, Two broken bones, especially, is just dreadful. Three today. players got hit by a pitch in yeah. the same inning from the gonna same say. pitcher as who hit Young. And Phil Natan was on a rampage. Even, he's the only one who even left the game. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm so annoyed. He had a massive game, too, before yeah. he left. Three for four with a sock and a shoe. He's it's really good. One. First stolen base. He had four RBI, so... Yeah, just really unfortunate. Uh, some other replacements that could be out there. These are the most added third baseman on CBS. Matt Chapman is up to 72% rostered. Colt Keith, 60%. A. Eugenio Suarez, 56%. Michael Garcia is also 56%. And Michael B- Bush is 41%. Uh, how would you rank that group of five? Chapman, Keith, Suarez, Garcia, and Bush. I might go Garcia one. Actually, I know he's less rostered than Keith and Chapman. Keith hasn't shown us much yet, but he also hasn't struck out very much. I think it's th- two and 14 plate appearances or three, something like that. So not too concerned there, but Garcia is someone who we talked about coming into the season, having 91.8 mile per hour average exit velocity last season, but only a 2% barrel rate or something like that. He just did not hit the ball hard and in the air at the same time. Well, he's got a couple home runs already, and he's hitting lead off, and he can steal some bases. I think 15 homers and 25 stolen bases is well within the realm of possibility for Michael Garcia with a useful batting average. So I, I think he's 
just under rostered even without the young injury. Yeah, I like him best for categories league, maybe mm -hmm. second best of that group for points leagues. I might move Michael Bush to the top for points leagues. He's just got to show us something. I agree. Yeah. I I agree. I I lobbied to make sure he was included in this segment, but yeah, he just hasn't done anything at the major league level in, in any regard yet. It's very small sample size. I think it's still less than a hundred total plate appearances, including last year. But he I, just I saw hasn't couple, done it yet. I saw a couple people tweeting me their options from mm -hmm. a points league and like Jake Berger was out there. Oh, wow. They tend to be shallower. Yes. Points leagues aren't Berger's best format anyway, but if you have a higher end option like that, then obviously you don't have to mess with these other guys. And then in deeper leagues, JD Davis is up to 21% rostered and a gentleman named Trey Lipscomb from the nationals. He's up to 7% rostered. He has started three games in a row at third base with Nick Senzel on the IL. Back-to-back -back multi hit games. He had a home run on Sunday. He stole a base on Saturday. He's 23 years old. He's a third round pick from back in 2022. Did have some prospect standing and interest. I mean, we're talking pretty deeply, like 15 team roto and only type stuff, but Trey Lipscomb of the Nationals. Yeah. Yeah, I can't say I have any interest. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the rest of the news and notes. We already mentioned what's going on with Esteri Ruiz. Bo Bichette has missed two straight. Due to neck spasms, Ernie Clement started at shortstop for the Blue Jays. Blake Snell will make his Giants debut next Monday, April 8th, against the Nationals. Justin Verlander threw a three-inning, 52-pitch simulated game on Monday and came out of it without any issues. His next step is expected to be a rehab assignment. Jordan Montgomery is scheduled to make a start at AAA Reno on Sunday, and he said he's aiming to make his D-backs debut on April 19th. Brian Wu has begun a throwing program. He was shut down for a little over a week with right elbow inflammation. He is 25% available in CBS Fantasy League. So that's that's one that if you have a roster spot to play with, obviously won't make an immediate impact. But if you don't need a starting pitcher right now, I think I'd rather have him than Ronel Blanco and Ronel Blanco. Probably uh... I think there's there's more long term appeal there even if, you know, he's less likely to make an impact at this point. I mean, if you have free IL spots, it's a no-brainer. Yes. But I, I think if you're in the sort of shallow league where Brian Wu might actually be available, I think I'd go with the headline grabber right now. Take my shot on Ronel Blanco or Hauk while I still can. That's fair. Jordan Romano is set to throw a bullpen session Tuesday. He's on the IL due to right elbow inflammation. Alec Manoa will pitch a three-inning simulated game with minor leaguers on Tuesday. He only made one spring outing, uh, one spring start due to right shoulder soreness and due to just being bad. He so. has to show a lot in a minor league rehab assignment to be worth yeah. even a speculative ad, I think, at this point. But I think it helps that Bowden Francis was pretty bad today against yes. the Astros. So uh, if he continues to pitch like that, and Manoa looks okay, he could get called back up, or Ricky Tiedemann could be an option, um, again, if Bowden Francis continues to struggle. Eloy Jimenez is day-to-day -day after undergoing an MRI on his left adductor. Kenley Jansen was available to pitch on Monday after dealing with back tightness the previous two days. He wasn't needed because the Red Sox crushed the Oakland A's. Braxton Garrett will throw a three-inning and or 50-pitch simulated game at uh, extended spring training on Tuesday. Alec Thomas was placed on the I.O. with a strained left hamstring. Jake McCarthy was recalled and started in right field. Scott, this is who I was thinking about as a deep league Ruiz replacement. Uh, McCarthy has 49 steals over the past two years, so I, it's only a deep league option, but mm -hmm. it could make some sense there. Sure. He could get back to mattering with that stolen base ability he has. He didn't hit at all in the majors last year, so I'm pretty cold on him right now but if you're in a deep enough five outfielder league and speed is something you desperately need then mccarthy has the profile for it tyler mcgill was placed on the 15 day il and won't throw for the next five days before beginning his ramp up process it was due to a shoulder injury the most likely replacement is one of jose buto or joey lucchese they but... they don't need a fifth starter for like eight days okay so I wonder if they just don't uh, have one. Yeah, I don't know. That's They're, possible. I mean, I was going to say rotation is real bad. On, 
I, look, Christian Scott is yeah. a prospect in the organization who, who's, I think, has a decent amount of upside. I just don't think that they're going to rush him. So um, it's probably going to happen later on in the season for him. Jason Hayward was out of the lineup due to back tightness. Teoscar Hernandez was in right field with Chris Taylor in left. And Mike Clevenger agreed to a contract with the White Sox last year, a 377 ERA, 123 whip. The underlying numbers did not really line up with any of that. Chris, any interest in uh, Clevenger deeper leagues? Uh, I'm an AL only labor and I would have to drop someone to pick him up. Like someone in my starting lineup. And I have less than zero interest in doing that. <laughs> All right. Some quick prospect notes. Orioles top prospect Jackson holiday started his minor league season with back-to-back -back multi hit games. His first at bat was actually a home run off of a lefty. So if he keeps that up, I think we're going to see him pretty soon. Pirates top prospect Paul Skeens threw three perfect innings with five strikeouts in his first start at AAA. And the unfortunate news, Ray's top prospect, Junior Caminero, crushed a home run. That's not the bad news. But what happened after that is he left the game with a quad injury, and then he was placed in the IL on Monday, which I, I think could delay his promotion. So I did see a quote that they're hoping it's more or less a minimum stay. The the seven day IL is what they have in the minors. So no guarantees there, but that, that was some, that was one thing I saw. So fingers crossed. All right, let's take our final break. When we return, we'll get into the rest of Monday's waiver wire pitchers. And we'll do that right after this. You hear that? It's the heartbeat of American soccer, and this rivalry is going to get loud. The USL on CBS and streaming live on Paramount plus. Welcome back in. Let's continue on with Monday's waiver wire pitchers. We already spoke about Ronel Blanco and Tanner Houck. Sean Manaya looked pretty great in his Mets debut against the Tigers. Six shutout innings, one hit, two walks, eight strikeouts with 13 swinging strikes on 88 pitches. And Reese Olsen on the other side of that game um, at the Mets. Five and two-thirds shutout, three hits, two walks, three strikeouts with 13 swinging strikes. He just threw the kitchen sink at the Mets. He threw uh, six different pitches between 6% and 25% usage in this one. Scott, would you take Reese Olsen or Manaya over either of Tanner Houck or Ronel Blanco? Well, we kind of did talk about that earlier, and I think I decided that in, in the leagues where Reese Olsen is available, this start good as it was, is more likely to slip by people than the Ronel Blanco and Tanner Houck start. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a contradiction because I have more faith in Reese Olsen being a satisfactory pitcher in the majors, but I, I think at least where he's available, there's a better chance you'll get more chances at him. Doesn't mean you can't pick him up. If, if somebody beats you to Blanco or Houck, I, I was encouraged by this start for Reese Olsen and in particular, I, I, I was encouraged by the changeup use because that was his fourth most thrown pitch last year and it was his most thrown pitch in this start. And when he began featuring the changeup more last September, his production improved quite a bit. So I think that's an encouraging development for Reese Olsen. I'm not sure why he faded the slider so much, which is his best pitch. But the fact that he could throw five and two-thirds, three-hit innings without throwing the slider that much, I think is reason to be encouraged in and of itself. So overall, I'm impressed by what Reese Olsen did here. But I understand you can't pick up everybody. And we're not taking any of the pitchers we've mentioned so far over Jared Jones, Flaherty, Gavin Stone, Garrett Crochet, no. right? Agree. Not doing that. Okay. Not even, not even Blanco. <laughs> uh, waiver wire pitchers part two. Luis Heal came one out away from qualifying for the win at the D-backs four and two thirds. One hit allowed, one run, six strikeouts with 10 swinging strikes on 84 pitches. And uh, the last time we saw Luis Heal get an extended look was back in 2021. He was mostly fastball slider then, and he mixed in his change of 20% today. I thought that was interesting. The velocity was up too. He averaged 97.7 miles per hour on the fastball. Max Meyer looked pretty good against the Angels. Five innings, two runs, four strikeouts in that one. Dane Dunning turned in a quality start at the Rays. Six and a third, three runs allowed. Seven strikeouts, 18 swinging strikes. I don't think that was really like a Dane Dunning thing. It might've just been Tampa Bay strikes out a lot kind of thing. Uh, and then Mackenzie Gore 
Well, Chris, I know you have a lot to say here. Mm-hmm. Interesting outing because on paper, it doesn't look that great. Mm-hmm. Five and a third innings, three runs, six strikeouts. But he had 14 swinging strikes. The velocity was up. He changed the pitch mix. He added in this changeup as well. He's 68% rostered, so he's already kind of rostered in a good amount of leagues, but I thought the start was pretty interesting. What do you think about Mackenzie Gore, Dunning, Meyer, and Luis Heal? I think Mackenzie Gore is by far the most interesting of this group, and he's the most widely rostered of that group, so that's not surprising, but nothing that Heal, Meyer, or Dunning did, I think, was enough to bridge the gap that already existed between them. Meyer, obviously, because he's a top prospect, has some intrigue, but I tend to think unless like Puck has another start like that or Rogers and Weathers are just disasters, I would guess Max Myers probably the first one out of the Marlins rotation when Braxton Garrett or Edward Cabrera, probably Edward Cabrera first are available. So that's my hesitation with him. Gore, though, like you said, I, I think the discussions always start with the fastball with him and it was up two miles per hour in this one, 97 miles per hour. That's really, really hard for a lefty. And it's a fastball that he's always gotten good results with already. But then he kind of changed up the rest of the pitches, the slider. He's throwing it harder with less vertical breaks. So presumably more like either a gyro or a, even a cutter, perhaps he averaged 92 miles per hour with it. Um, And then the changeup went in the opposite direction. That's what I think is really interesting about Mackenzie Gore's performance today because he's really always been just fastball, slider, curveball, and he's never had that fourth pitch to round out the arsenal, give a different look. And in this one, the velocity on the changeup was down 1.8 miles per hour. The spin rate was down 282 RPMs, and that's a big thing for a changeup. He has a high spin changeup to begin with, and that's kind of the opposite of what you want. You tend to want your changeups to have not much spin, so they die when they get closer to the plate. Hopefully getting a little bit less spin off of it, a little less, a little more velocity separation helps the pitch play up. He did get three whiffs with it. He threw 17 of them. That is the most he's ever thrown in a start. So it doesn't necessarily mean Mackenzie Gore is suddenly an ace. He didn't pitch like one today even, but I, I think it's, one of the more interesting per- pitching performances by anyone. And if I have a roster spot to play with, I think a, a low dollar bid for Mackenzie Gore tonight makes a lot of sense. Gore Blanco. Mm. Um, If you have to add one, I think it would have to be Blanco just because who's adding Mackenzie Gore after this start? Nobody except for me, I guess. Everyone. It was an okay start, but yeah, I, I agree that that I would take Blanco or Hauk over But Gore. I, I think the likeliest outcome is Gore is a better pitcher the rest of the way. It's just trying to play that game of who do you have to add right now. I don't know that Gore has proven any more than Tanner Hauk has. I, I mean, he had that better prospect pedigree coming up, but I, I don't know how much that matters to me anymore at this stage of their careers. So I... I, I don't even know that I could confidently say I think he'll be the better pitcher the rest of the year. Obviously, Ronel Blanco is the biggest wild card of the three. Mm-hmm. Like we know Gore has a rotation spot. We know Hauk has a rotation spot, but I don't That's know. That's fair. I'd I'd put Gore probably behind the two of them as far as potential pickups go. And I don't want to like gloss over what Luis Heel did here because he had a very strong spring. He th- mm-hmm. he throws a hundred miles per hour with good swing and miss characteristics on that fastball. And it carried over to the regular season one start, and he allowed one hit, you know, four and two-thirds innings. Okay, we need to see him work deeper into games. I think if if he continues to have success, he obviously will. He's pretty interesting as a potential pickup, too, but behind basically all the other guys. Yeah, the problem about. is I, I think there might be like 10 pitchers who've pitched so far that I'd rather – who are – somewhat available that I'd rather add yeah. than Luis Heal. And if you play in a league with quality starts or a points league where you get a bonus for quality starts, I don't know how often Luis Heal is going to qualify for those. Yeah. And it, it's not just because of this start, but I think he could be effectively wild at times and maybe a little bit inefficient and, and just not going to go as deep into starts as a result of that. So I, I like him, but probably more so for a categories league. Uh, with Luis Heal. And I, I want to say it, I'll, I'll say it a few times until we really get used to saying 
until he really becomes a regular part of the fantasy conversation. Heel is spelled G I L. Yes. I do want to ask you guys an overreaction question here from Monday's action. And uh, Ryan Pepio, he got hit pretty hard going up against one of the better lineups in baseball with the Texas Rangers. Five and two thirds innings, six runs allowed, four walks to three strikeouts. He had five walks total all of last season with the Dodgers. 42 innings worth of uh, pitching, five walks, and then in this first start, uh, four walks with the Tampa Bay Rays. He's 89% rostered. He's RP only on CBS to start the year. Uh, would you drop Ryan Pepio for any of the names we've mentioned today? I don't think it's an overreaction to ask that at all. That doesn't necessarily mean I think the answer is yes, but like he was my 256th ranked player coming into the season in Roto League. So, so you were drafting a, him. That's a pretty easy player to drop. Yeah. Um, I think I have him in one points league, maybe. So that's a pretty yeah. easy to drop. It's I, harder in a points league because he's RP eligible. And you may have, as I did in a few leagues, built your entire pitching staff around having as many RP options as possible uh, mm -hmm. or Sparps. So, you know, I, I want to give him more time. But yeah, the the track record for success here is very, very limited. Ryan Pepio has always been a guy that fantasy baseball players like more than real prospect folks so yeah i think it's perfectly reasonable so ryan pepio was the on average drafted around 180 mm -hmm. even though you had him quite a bit lower in your rankings and his his last couple starts in spring training were outstanding mm -hmm. it's obviously he struggled with control in this one and that's a little unnerving because he has a history of bad control major turnaround last year became an elite control guy and that was that that helped to to key his breakthrough four walks all spring so the control was there in the calendar year 2024 and um i think the upside for pepio particularly now that he's being handled by the rays is too high for me to consider dropping him for anyone we've talked about mm. more like ryan peppy you am i right <laughs> Peppy, Sorry. yes, is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, Scott, sticking with him. Chris, maybe not. Waiver wire hitters. Do should any of these hitters be rostered in more leagues than they already are? Brendan Donovan, three for four with his first home run of the season, three runs, two RBI. He is 70% rostered, has let off all five games for the Cardinals. Ryan Mountcastle went two for four with his first home run of the season. He's off to a nice start. He's got six hits, seven RBI. He's only 58% rostered. That Seemed a little bit low uh, for Ryan Mountcastle. Jose Siri had another big game, two for three, with his first home run. He attempted another steal but was caught, unfortunately. 29% rostered, and that comes after uh, picking up three steals this weekend. Michael Conforto stayed hot, hit his third home run of the year, and he is 53%. So, uh, yeah, Conforto 53, Siri 29, Mountcastle 58, Donovan 70. Should any of those percentages be higher? How many, what percentage of leagues are Roto, do you think? Roto or, or categories? Games. Stolen bases are important in those leagues. I think probably higher than 29%. 50 to 60% maybe? Jose Siri should be rostered in more than 29% of leagues is the, the point that I am building towards. Because, yes, he was caught stealing. He attempted a fourth stolen base. He only attempted 15 all of last season. Now... I, I will point out something that I wrote about in, I think, my column on Monday uh, about, oh gosh, I'm making a mess on my desk. I'm sorry. Hold on. Something's falling. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I, want to even you, the cat's I want to get you one of those cameras that looks <laughs> down on your hands like while you're typing so we can just so, see everything that's All happening. right. So if you've noticed, you're probably hearing my keyboard less uh, over the past couple of weeks. I switched to a quieter keyboard. But I keep my other keyboard just like I throw it on top of a pile of stuff on my desk. And I tried to grab something below the keyboard and everything came tumbling down. <laughs> oh, God. So it was kind of a mess. I <laughs> lost my train of thought. Jose Siri, uh, the, the point that I will, was, will make is, do you guys remember Ramon Laureano in the 2021 season? Who doesn't remember Ramon Laureano in the 2021 season? Stole five bases in the first four games. I think eight in the first nine had four steals in the final 79 games of the season. Yikes. 
running a lot early on in the season does not necessarily mean you will continue to run. And I guess if Jose Siri gets caught a bunch, he will likely slow down. But it's all to say that he's an elite athlete, 98th percentile sprint speed. He hit 25 homers last season. I think there's a chance he's like a 25-25 guy this season and is not that different from what I expect from like Lane Thomas. So, yes, I think Jose Siri should be rostered in all categories leagues right now. Batting Siri's average will be a problem. Siri set a goal of 30 yes. steals this spring, which, you know, doesn't mean he has to follow through on that goal, but stolen bases are largely a matter of intent, and he seems to have the intent right now. Mm-hmm. Anything else uh, on those other names? Any enthusiasm? Donovan, Mountcastle, Conforto? Uh, Mountcastle, what did you say the percentage was? 50, 58. 58%. That's pretty low. I saw Jose it probably Abreu covers 84%. Like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather have Mountcastle than Abreu. Yeah, I might go Mountcastle over yeah. him. I, I think probably there's some points league hesitation on Mountcastle because the, the plate discipline is not very good, and I understand that. There's a lot of points leagues and on CBS sports leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's off to a great start and deserves to be rostered more than a Brayu. I agree with that completely. Two names in deeper leagues, Richie Palacios of the Rays, one for three with a walk, a sock and a shoe. It was his first hit of the season. He's only started three of five games so far for Tampa Bay. He's 2% rostered and Tyler Freeman, who is on the guardians one for four with his first home run. He has started four of five games. He's got a homer. He's got a steal. I was looking into his fan graphs, projected grades, uh, prospect grades, and he was supposed to have like a 70 hit tool, 55 speed. So I, there might be something there. Um, deep league stuff, but anything on Richie Palacios or Tyler Freeman? Yeah, not... If, if Tyler Freeman begins running a lot i think Mm -hmm. he'll be of interest i don't think there's enough power otherwise for us to care about him in fantasy but he is the one you know there was a lot of talk this spring about uh chase delauder and Mm -hmm. and the big performance he had and when they dfa'd miles straw oh does this is this clear a path for delauder well it seems like they were getting rid of Miles Straw to clear a path for Tyler Freeman because they had a bunch of shortstop prospects and Freeman, they've transitioned him to the outfield. So they seem to like him. And yes, there is supposed to be a pretty good hit tool, but he, he's going to ne- have to make a pretty big speed contribution, sort of like Stephen Kwan does for us to, for him to be of interest in fantasy, I would say. Agreed. All right, let's get into the rest of the leftovers, and we'll start with the pitchers. Charlie Morton was solid at the White Sox, five and two-thirds shutout innings with six strikeouts and 12 swinging strikes. Velocity was down in this game, but uh, it was 46 degrees, as I mentioned earlier, in Chicago, so that might have affected some of the velocity for Charlie Morton. Uh, Christopher Sanchez pitched well against the Reds, five innings, two runs, eight strikeouts to one walk, 13 swinging strikes on 85 pitches. Sinker was up 2.2 miles per hour. The changeup was up almost three miles per hour compared to last year. And James- I, if I can go ahead and interject, go ahead. I am relieved. I am relieved as somebody who was heavily invested in Christopher Jan- Sanchez. I liked him to begin with, but I became increasingly invested as his price fell because of his terrible spring training where he wasn't getting strike. It wasn't doing anything right. It, he was throwing much harder. Um, and there was some concern that, you know, maybe that was compromising his command because he gained such good command last year by throwing softer. Well, best of both worlds here in his season debut. The velocity was way up still. He threw two thirds of his pitches for strikes and walked one batter, struck out eight. So, very encouraged, very encouraging performance here for Christopher Sanchez. And, uh, I continue to believe he could be a a big time breakout this year. Agreed. James Paxton in his Dodgers debut was wild, but didn't give up any runs against the Giants. Five shutout, four hits, five walks, five strikeouts, 12 swinging strikes on 97 pitches. The velocity was down here for Paxton. Fastball was down 1.5 miles per hour. The cutter down 1.6 miles per hour, but it was a, I guess, a fine start. Chris, anything to add on Paxton or Charlie Morton? 
Paxton and Morton are both like 90% rostered in CBS Fantasy Leagues. And I find that kind of surprising. I was surprised to see Paxton um, wasn't as rostered as he is. Yeah, because like I, I was like, oh, maybe I'll write about Charlie Morton for the waiver wire portion of tomorrow's newsletter. Nope. He is almost universally rostered. I think both are probably too high, even though they were like decent today. I well, I, I do think, I think they're again, fine to have around. Points. That's the points league influence on CBS roster rates. I mean, there's no points league where Charlie Morton is going to be given the team he plays for and the number of innings he throws. Yeah, I guess. And he was Pax- like Morton. I don't even think was like a 400 point player last year, though. He was even though he threw a bunch of innings on a good team. Um, but you know how deep we go into the pitcher yeah. rankings in those points league drafts. Yeah, yeah, I he, I, I get what you're saying. like Paxton especially because his his grip on the, on a rotation spot it has to be so tenuous, given all the Dodgers options and his health history. But uh, but Morton, I get why he's that rostered. Yeah, I I kind of feel like I'd be okay jettisoning either of those guys for whatever interesting pitcher du jour is available run out blanco tanner hauk reese olsen uh i i i'd drop those two guys for any of those guys paxton absolutely regardless of format morton i think i could do that in a categories league i'd, I'd be hesitant in a points league but i think yeah. i agree with you for categories leagues some hitting standouts. Austin Riley is on the board with his first home run, two for four with four RBI. Bobby Witt, two for four with a sock and a shoe. His second home run of the season, his first uh, steal. He had four hard hits in this game, three over 109 exit velocity. That is Bobby Witt. Mike Trout, double dong, one of which. Oh, my God. 475 feet. I, 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 I was watching that game, and it was the fifth longest home run that's ever been hit in Marlins Park. And it was to a part of the park I had only ever seen Giancarlo Stan reach. It was like, yeah, what I had to stop what I was doing and just marvel at it. Like just hit repeat <laughs> a few times. It was so impressive. I yeah, just stay healthy. Just stay healthy. He's he could hit forty home runs this year with sixty RBI. That, that <laughs> might actually. Have. I, th- I think the Angels had four solo home runs today. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, Kyle wow. Tucker. Wow, I'm seeing this. I'm watching this now. It's. It, that I is the, so far. You don't see baseballs land there in Marlins Park. It's over that M, like that was behind where the home run sculpture yeah. used to be, into the concourse there in front of the windows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's impressive. Check it out. Kyle Tucker, two for three with a double dong for RBI. His teammate, Yiner Diaz, two for four with a double dong as well. Jaron Duran, more like Duran, Duran, Duran. Three for five with three steals. That's right. Not one, not two, but three. The A's are so bad, by the way. They had <laughs> five errors in the first three innings of the game. I, I, uh, you just can't even make that stuff up. Tasker Hernandez hit a three-run homer. That's his fourth already. And uh, I was just thinking more about the Dodgers lineup. And, and if you're a pitcher trying to navigate the Dodgers lineup, you would kind of think, all right, in the second half, maybe I can let up a little bit. And you can't like Teoscar Hernandez is batting sixth or seventh in this lineup on most days. It's he's just going to have so many pitches to hit this year. It's, he could really have a massive season. Yeah. Anthony Volpe went four for four with two doubles and he has looked really good so far as well. I've watched almost every inning of every Yankee game and he is very poised at the plate. He's very disciplined so far. He's not chasing. He just looks like a different player. We'll see if he can keep that up. Spencer steer two for five with a grand slam. His first Homer of the year. Seems like the Reds are going to run wild again this season, by the way. They had five steals on Monday. Ellie like Cruz. 14 attempts in four games, I think, Oof. for the Reds as yeah. a whole. Ellie Dela Cruz picked up his second. Stuart Fairchild stole two bases. Bubba Thompson picked up his third. Yeah, you know who leads the team in steals? <laughs> Bubba Thompson, who has three steals and zero plate appearances. Oh, God. Uh, this is where uh, it's been too long since the, the days of Terrence Gore. That that was so I'm, exactly I'm happy that we're having someone like this back in our lives. That was exactly the name I was thinking of, too. Uh, Will Benson picked up his first stolen base as well. Mm-hmm. Shout out to the Pirates, who are 5-0 and for the first time since 1983. They've somehow opened their season against five straight lefties. I, I wish, I don't know how to look it up, but that is wild. Like, 
when was the last time a team opened up against five lefties in a row? I don't think Connor Joe is going to be there every day. <laughs> yeah, like he's let off every game, but I think that's just because they face lefties every game. I think so, too. Uh, I think against righties, it's probably going to be O'Neill Cruz, but mm -hmm. we just haven't seen that yet. Brian There's Reynolds. A, Go ahead, Scott. They should have a string of righties coming up. I believe this Mackenzie Gore here was the, the only lefty the Pirates are scheduled to face this week. So yeah. look out for Jack Sawinski. Mm, let's go. Brian Reynolds off to a nice start. Multiple hits in three of five games. He has eight RBI. Henry Davis, two for four with two doubles in this one, one of which one 11.5 exit velocity, one more start a catcher, and he gains eligibility on CBS. And Michael Taylor had himself a nice game, three for four with two runs and an RBI. He did steal a base over the weekend. Another name for really deep leagues, NL labor, uh, NL labor, duh. NL only, or like 15 team, five outfielder leagues. All right. He here's the next lefty the Pirates face. Tarek Skubal. Ooh. T tough, tough break for Connor Joe there. <laughs> hey, hey, Connor Joe's off to a nice start too. I don't want to hear it. Uh, some bullpen updates. Speaking of those Pirates, Aroldis Chapman entered the game with two outs in the ninth inning, two runners on, and an 8-4 lead. He got the final out for his first save. David Bednar pitched on Saturday and Sunday, so my guess is he was unavailable. The Pirates have four saves, none of which have gone to David Bednar. <laughs> which is just, its there's nothing there. It's I think two of them have been extra innings. It's its just been a weird start. I think one of them was a multi-inning save when they were up by like four. I, I'm not. No, no David Bednar concerns. For the Orioles, Craig Kimbrell got the ninth inning with a one-run lead. He gave up a single to Kyle Isbell and then pinch runner Dyrone Blanco stole second and third base. He scored on a sacrifice fly, so it was a blown save for Kimbrell. He wound up with the win because on the other side for the Royals, Nick Anderson got the bottom of the ninth of the game tied. He gave up a walk-off home run to Jordan at Westberg. For the Marlins, round and round we go. Where we stop? Who knows? Tanner Scott was called upon in the eighth inning with the game tied to face the top of the Angels lineup. He walked the first three batters he faced. He somehow only allowed one run. Anthony Bender then started the ninth inning. He gave up, uh, I think it was two runs on two hits. Somebody asked this on Twitter. I don't think it's crazy. The chances that AJ Puck could wind up as the Marlins closer again. Yeah, I mean, when when they announced that he was going to be in the rotate or going to try to be in the rotation at the beginning of spring training, I wrote my relief pitcher preview and I, I chose him as my sleeper for relief pitcher. And I said, it's pretty unlikely that this works out and he is a good starter. And I softened my stance on that as spring went on. But I also said, if it fails, he could still be the closer at some point. So I do think there's a chance that that happens. All right. For the Tigers, Jason Foley pitched in, but did strike out two. And then for the Mariners, Andres Munoz entered in the eighth with a two run lead to face the heart of the Guardians lineup, three, four, and five. He gave up a solo homer to Josh Naylor. Ryan Stanek then got the ninth and he picked up his first save. Kind of looks like maybe Munoz is just their highest leverage reliever. Oh, wow. This is the way Scott's service has always handled things, mm -hmm. even. After Paul Seawald was traded last year, remember there was a lot of this going on with Andres Munoz then and, and when Paul Seawald was still there. At times he would work an earlier inning. So so Scott Service has has been playing the the leverage game for a long time at relief pitcher. Munoz is still obviously the guy to roster from the Mariners rotation or bullpen. But it's going to be frustrating at times. There's there's a history of that for Seattle closers. And we will wrap up with Scott's favorite segment to stream or not to stream. Oh, That's right. I thought we were going to go away from this. <laughs> Come on, Scott. We got to help out the daily lineup leaguers out there. Uh, so the way this will work is at the end of every podcast, I will present some starters pitching on the day of the podcast and the following day, depending on the league format that you play in. Uh, but give me your two or three favorites from Tuesday. I'm not going to run through the entire list, but you could see them here on, on the screen. Casey Mize, Javier Assad, and Reynaldo Lopez. Re revenge game for Reynaldo. Yeah, I would take Reynaldo Lopez over Assad, but I, I agree those are the top three. Mize is at the Mets. Uh, Assad is at against the Rockies. And as you said, Frank Lopez against the White Sox. And then on Wednesday... 
Does AJ Puck bounce back? He faces the Angels. I mean, I, I'm i not dropping him, but do I really want to start him after that six-walk start? I, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather see what happens with him on my bench. Having said that, this is, kind of, this is kind of the problem with the streaming section. There are <laughs> never good options, and he might be the best of these bad options. I, I think I'd throw Chris Paddock out there, but I've been a little more optimistic about Paddock than you guys, so that, that's the one. Yeah, and I think that's a good disclaimer, Scott. Just because we're recommending these names doesn't necessarily mean they're good or that we even really like them. But these yeah. are the names that are rostered in less than 75% of CBS leagues. So if you're looking for streamers, these also, are the available. You are, Logan, Logan you are asking us to make chicken salad out of chicken crap. <laughs> and you can't be surprised if the crap goes to crap. That being said, Logan T. Allen, Logan Taylor Allen, I remain interested in him as a sleeper-ish, and uh, I wouldn't start him against the Mariners if I could avoid it, but don't mind having him on my roster along with Paddock and A.J. Puck to see what happens. And I can't imagine someone being desperate on a Wednesday in the second week of the season, but if for some reason you are, I, I could imagine, I could see Jose Quintana against the Tigers. Yeah, that's another one that just, out at yeah. Well. All right, we're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we will be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.